right, well, as it is Mother's Day, it's a very, very special day, and I'm doing something very different and a very, very special Mother's Day message for you. So instead of saying, would you grab your Bibles, I'm, I'm glad that you have your Bibles with you, but I have so much scripture to share today. The scripture is in your bulletins. So if you will look at your bulletins, you should have a handout because it's got like 40 verses in it. And what I wanted to do is to do a Bible study. Can we do a Bible study? But I know that not everybody in this room could turn to this verse and this verse and this verse. You know, and we would. And so for those of us who are not yet familiar to exactly to know where Obadiah is and so forth, I put it all into one little handout so that we could go through a special Mother's Day Bible study and see what God's word says about mothers and Mother's Day and how we can approach Mother's Day. Amen. So I want to address all the issues because I know some of you, this is a wonderful weekend. Some of you, it's a difficult weekend. God knows and God's heart is here for you and I. So, Heavenly Father. I thank you that you alone are love. You alone can give unconditional love. Lord, we can mimic it. We can call it. We can talk about it. But Lord, you alone have it. Forgive us for our prejudgmental disposition that somehow just comes with the flesh. It's almost as if we come out of the womb judging. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us tonight to see where your hand has been, guiding, leading, and directing, and showing us love, your love and love through others. And so Lord, I pray right now that your Holy Spirit would comfort hearts that need to be comforted. Those parents right now that are perhaps raising a prodigal right now, and the child is not living according to your word, will, and way, and right now the mother's heart is heavy, Lord. She said, Lord, you said, train up my child in the way that they should go and they will not depart. And right now, Lord, I just pray you would increase their faith in you. Give them that peace that passes understanding. Lord, for those who have had a difficult situation with their mom, Lord, I pray right now, again, your presence, your power, your word to do something miraculous. And that's what's so fun. Your word doesn't return void. So why should we talk about anything tonight but you? And so God, let your word minister. May we celebrate. May we be encouraged. May we love as we have been loved by you. Thank you. So speak now. May I and all of us decrease and you increase in us. In your name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, as I mentioned before, this is a special day for a very special group of people. Well, what do I mean by that? Let me read this for you. It says this. Today is a unique day because it's far bigger than we think. Because there are so many different kinds of mothers and all are being honored today. So listen to this list of mothers and how they're being listened. First of all, for the mother who has chosen to stay at home while her children are little, may your patience be great and your influence even greater. For the single mom who never planned on doing this alone, may you be consistently strengthened by your heavenly father and may you hear his voice singing over you, that beautiful Zephaniah 3 verse. For the mother who strives to balance work outside of the house with love inside of the house, may you be given energy, validation, and hope as you make the leap from one world to another every day. For moms who have the poor mothers themselves, but now refuse to let that pattern repeat itself, may the God, godly legacy you've started be carried on for generations to come. For mothers with grown adult children, may today be filled with laughter and joy, and may you experience deep satisfaction and fulfillment. For women who have no biological children of their own, but who mother younger women as mentors, may you understand your role as a calling from God and as a transformation of their hearts. Today is a unique day. So for all the mothers we mentioned, and even those we didn't, be blessed, be honored, be filled with joy. You are making the world a better place because you're filling it with a love only a mom can give. Amen? Amen. What a wonderful blessing. Now, if you're not taking notes with me tonight, let's start with right here, and that is this, the God-ordained antidote to pain and loss. We've been talking about that as we've been seeing Paul and what he's been going through. But the God-ordained antidote to pain and loss is love. Giving it and receiving it. Now, listen to me. All of us in this room, as we've been talking about, have endured pain, suffering, loss. We talked about it quite a bit last week. But the God-ordained anecdote to this is, in fact, love. But the secret is giving it and receiving it. And remember last week we looked at this verse because we talked about the difficulty of this. It is more blessed to what? Give. 
Give and receive. And I talked about the fact that most have not yet learned that giving is receiving. But what we really need to learn is sometimes what we need to give is people the opportunity to, to give to us. And so often we've got this spiritual, prideful humility. Oh, no, 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 I'm good, I got it. And like I said, you'll do 90 trips when it would have just been nine with 10 people helping you. And so we have this thing where we don't allow people to find the joy of ministering unto you, just like we love serving other people. And so it's a subversive pride that seems and acts like it's humility. But in reality, if it is more blessed to give, then it's our kuleana to give and then to let others also do the same. And so one of the most common descriptions ever given of a mom is that she is a giver. Isn't that fair to say? When we're to think about what is mom, when she is given this, she's giving that, she's always giving, giving, giving. And if you are a mom, again, you find yourself loving it when you are giving. Majority of the time, you are loving what you're doing. That's what makes Mother's Day so special. A mother's love. A mother's love is something that's written about, sung about, and it's even joked about. What did I talk about on Easter? That's a face only a mother can love. And again, why we said that that is so true is because mom can see themselves in that child. They see their husband. They see their, current, their grandparent, their own parent, whatever it would be. They can see the love. They can see themselves within that child. And that's why we can just, that's a face only a mother can love. But the reason that they do is that there's something uniquely connected that they see themselves in this. Now, as I've mentioned already, I know that not everyone here today had an amazing relationship with your mom as God intended. When God designed the family, that is exactly how he wanted us to be. In fact, some of you today find yourself as moms and you're not exactly sure how to be a good and godly mom because you didn't have that role model in front of you. You've seen the woundedness of your own mom and you say, oh gosh, I don't want to pass that on to my children. First thing first I want to say to you and that is this. There's an amazing worship song on the radio right now that I just can't hear it enough and that's fear is a liar. Oh, I just got Jesus bumps again right now. Fear is a liar. And so the first thing you need to know is if you've just gone through hell and back and you feel like, I don't want to be a mom, I don't want to get into a family, I don't want to become a relationship because I don't want to, fear is a liar. Because what we really need to acknowledge and know first of all is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Folks, the Bible says we were all born in sin, meaning that there's not a one of us that comes out of the womb perfect. We were born with that sin nature. That's that whole slip of story that I show you over and over again. Let me show you what the Bible says. Psalm 51.5, right there in your notes. Behold, I was brought forth in what? In iniquity and in sin, my mother conceived me. Now, David is not saying my mom was a harlot. He's not saying I was unwed, she was unwed. No, 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 no. He's talking about the very sin nature that when two sinners have a child, the child himself has also got a sin nature. And again, people will go, oh, no, 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 man is basically good. I invite you tomorrow to come back and work in the nursery. Okay? They come in looking so cute. And then within five minutes, mine, bam, you know. And not a one of you moms, grandmas said, okay, when they bring out the cookies, you slap them and grab the biggest one. <laughs> We've got that innate in us, amen? amen. Okay. If, again, if you've got an issue, I'll set you up tomorrow. You can go work preschool. Okay. Now, if we understand that, that we ourselves have a sin nature, then that means we also have a desire for, a craving, a susceptibility to love. I just said the anecdote that God has given to us to pain and loss, which this whole world is constantly breeding in and out of the church. Amen. Okay. All of us have had a wounded story somehow, somewhere within even the body of Christ because it's a hospital filled with sinners. Okay. And so why do we put expectations that this room is supposed to be different than out there? I don't get that. I really don't. This is a place where we're walking in grace together. Amen? Amen. Okay, so then God gives us love. Now, according to Dr. Gary Chapman, he wrote that amazing book, The Five Love Languages. 
Exactly. And so he, he's looked it through and he's preached that message here. He's coming in our church and he shared that with us. These five love languages. First of all, words of affirmation. That time where there's these individuals who what you, can, you can do a million things, but just to be told that they are loved, told there's something special. Uh, the other love language is the quality time. Da, 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 not running around and just spend time with me. Not both of us looking in the same direction of the TV, but face to face, interaction, quality time. The other, the third love language is receiving gifts. There's some people that just when you, you bring something, it says, I was thinking of you when you weren't around and I'm expressing my love beyond and doing it in a way. So their love language is a giving of a gift to you. The other one is acts of service. Okay, when you do something specially out of the way, kindness, and so you wash their car and they come home and they see that the car is washed, whatever it is, this act of service that's ministering to them. And then the last one, of course, is physical touch. Physical touch. And this is so different with people. I personally love it when Cindy reaches over and she's just rubbing the back of my head when we drive. How she found out about that is because when she was driving, I would reach over and I would just be touching and she was like... <laughs> Don't mess with the hair. <laughs> and she's like, ah, oh, it feels like cockroach running on my neck. Ah. I'm like, hey, I'm just trying to make lonely, lonely love over here, you know? <laughs> I'm like, well, you can't me anytime. You know, I grab her hand, put it there. Okay, hello. <laughs> you can touch me. <laughs> we all respond in these different ways. Amen? Amen? One, two, three, four. I mean, you've got your primary. And if you've never had this conversation with your spouse and even with your kids, you need to have it. Because the thing we need to realize is that we're going to express love the way we like to be loved. I went on one date with Cindy. Two days later, I got a card in the mail. I'm like, the written word. So I go to Long's, buy 10 at a time, stick them in the briefcase, and whenever I'm in trouble, I send a card. You know, it's just kind of, that's how you do it. You know, you just learn the love language of people. Now, all of these love languages, according to what Gary was saying, and I totally agree, they all come from God's love. Amen? Because God is fluent in all languages, so God speaks all five of these languages, just like every language in the world. Because God is? He's love. Exactly. I always love telling people, especially on the Israel trip, because people are in Israel, and they're just falling in love with Hebrew, and it's this, and then you hear somebody say, oh, God's language is Hebrew, and when you get to heaven, the heaven, the language is Hebrew, and all those who get into the whole messianic thing, oh, God speaks Hebrew, and it's all about Hebrew, I'm like, ah. Eh. God speaks, we hear it in our language. Amen? Amen. So God speaks all languages, including our love language, which is so amazing. So here, stick with me. If our dad speaks this language of love, then we who are his kids, we get the privilege to become bilingual. You ever notice when someone is raised in a home that has a first language else in the home, the children get to grow up being masters of being bilingual. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, all my friends, when we were growing up, they were like, oh, I got to go to Chinese school, or I got to go to Japanese school, you know, or I got to go to this school. So they, they would go after school to this, and then they were able to actually sometimes interpret for the parents and go back and forth because the child is bilingual. Which reminds me, if you've ever heard that, what do you call someone who speaks three languages? Trilingual. Somebody speaks two languages? Bilingual. Somebody speaks one language? American. That's right. And there you go. American. All I can speak is English. Now, the thing that's so cool is that now I got a God who speaks my mother tongue and I speak the other language of whatever realm that I'm in, but I can become bilingual and speak God's love language. Are you hearing where I'm going with this? Are you feeling this, moms, children, understanding that God is giving us a way to connect in this love? Listen, we see motherly acts of love, service kind of love throughout the Bible. Look at Hannah. She prayed so much for a baby. And when she finally has a baby, look what it says there in 1 Samuel 2. And his mother would make him a little robe and bring it to him from year to year. And she would come up with her husband to offer yearly sacrifice. I mean, here's her son. He's in the temple being raised by Eli. And she would express this love in an act of service by bringing this to her. Now, I want you to look with me. You all know the Matthew 25, 32, the sheep and the goat story. 
We understand God's ministering and talking about literally how to love. He says, you guys go to church and you talk a good love, but let me show you what love looks like. And so he reads that verse. But what I want you to notice with me is this. Look at this. Starting in verse 35, when he says all the things about the people, he says this, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. What is that? That's gifts, acts of service. I was thirsty and you gave me drink, gifts, acts of service. I was a stranger and you invited me in, words of affirmation, quality time. Words of affirmation, I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was naked and you clothed me, again, gifts and acts of service. I was sick and you visited me, I was in prison and you came to me. Notice, quality time, words of affirmation. I was in these low points and you came and you spent time with me and you spoke to me. See, these are things that we see God expressing when he sees his disciples learning it, knowing it, and living it. So what I want us to look at today is this. Let's look at these five love languages of God. As God has parented us. As again, you may have said, all of a sudden I find myself being a mom, being a parent, and I'm not sure I have the role model. Yes, you do. It's found in the word of God. Now we often talk about God as father, and I will address that more in a moment. The Father's love. But you have to understand that there is just as much imagery in speaking about God in the maternal aspect of the heart of God. God, as I said, does not only not speak a language, he does not have a gender. God is God. Amen? Amen. So the limitation is language. So stick with me. The first thing we see here is words of affirmation. If this is a love language, how do I find this in the Bible? Words of affirmation. Well, the Bible is filled with words of affirmation where God literally verbalizes his love to us. Here's an example, Jeremiah 31, 3. The Lord appeared to him from afar, and what do I got highlighted? saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. He's speaking to them, saying, listen, I love you. You're kolohe. You continue to go back to idols. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Isaiah 41, for I am the Lord your God who upholds your right hand, who says to you, notice, who says to you, do not fear, I will help you. What an incredible godly parent saying, don't be afraid, I am there. And then of course, Matthew 28, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And again, if I had time, I could go through all of these and explain all these, but I wanted to let the word of God itself stand alone today and let you see, listen, here is God giving words of affirmation. Okay, what about quality time? How do we see God referencing quality time in the scripture? Well, let's start in the beginning. Genesis, the word, the book means in the beginning. And Enoch did what? He walked with God and he was not for God took him. And you've heard this pastor say over and over. I love that story. Because he wanted to spend quality time with Enoch. Enoch wanted to spend quality time with God. And so they took these long walks together. And I truly believe one day he took a walk so far, so long, God said, hey, Enoch, you're closer to my house than yours. Why don't you just come home with me? And he took him. But a lot of folks know Enoch, but they don't realize that that's not the only person that the Bible has this kind of relationship with. Same book, Genesis chapter 6. Look, these are the words and the records of the generations of Noah. And Noah was a what kind of man? What made him a righteous one? He was righteous and blameless in his time because Noah... Oh, that was quality time. Not 15 minutes before I got to go, jot something down in my journal, make sure I got it so I can check and then run into the car. As I've said many times, God doesn't want our devotions He wants our devotion. And so here's taking a walk with God. When's the last time you and I can say, yeah, I I walked with God. I spoke about that intimacy of just a closer walk with thee. Then notice in Luke chapter 6, what do we see Jesus doing? And it was at the end of the time that he went off to the mountain to pray and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. So Jesus modeling for us that relationship. As I always say, what made Jesus Jesus when he was in the incarnate here on earth? The answer is his relationship to the Father in prayer. 
We always see him going off by himself to pray, and that is where he found the strength, the wisdom, the power, just like you and I can, to live in a life full of critics. And so this is what it says. He went off and he spent that quality time with Father. Now, third love language is the love language of gifts. Do you know that in 31 times alone in the New Testament, in just the New Testament, 31 times it says, and he gave? I mean, God is a giver. This is just the New Testament. But let me just show you. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, then God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth, every tree that has fruit and its yielding seed, and it shall be food for you. My point in just showing that one, everything that we have around this, God has given us from the light to the seed to the air, to the, that we can breathe, that we can see tonight. None of this is a right. It is a gift. Amen? Amen. And we need to understand that. And this very day, we lived with gifts that God gave us. Whether or not we acknowledged it or not, they were gifts. Then you look at Luke chapter 10. Behold, I have given you, underline that, circle that, I have given you authority to tread upon the serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall injure you. Are we walking in that gift, or is that a Christmas or birthday gift that's still stuck under the tree and has never been opened? He says, why is this world having its impact on you rather than you having an impact on this world? I have given you a gift. He says, I've given you authority. Authority. And again, sometimes people will say, oh, you know, that guy, he's kind of cocky or kind of arrogant. No, there's a difference between being confident in the authority. Knowing that God is large and okay. God is love, just God is. And when you understand the authority of who God is, that makes all the difference in the world. But when you wanna talk gifts, come on, Christmas reminds us that God gave us the greatest gift of all, amen? Amen. What does it say? For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave. He gave his only begotten son, and whoever believes would not perish, but have eternal, everlasting life. So we see our Father, Definitely, our, our, our creator maker giving us words of affirmation, quality time, giving us gifts, and giving us acts of service. Now, when it comes to acts of service, come on, is that not exactly what the cross is all about? I mean, if that was the only thing that God ever did, he showed us the most incredible act of service because he paid our penalty. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ did what? He died for our sins according to to the scriptures. Amazing. Now, if you see that, that here's the very first thing that he has given to me in this act of service is that he died for our sins. That's what I first and foremost need to know. Then that defines love. Because someone would say, how come I don't feel loved? Or you say, no, 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 let me show you. The most amazing thing that could happen is that God himself came down to become a human being so that he might die for you. This is love, that a man would lay down his life for his friend. Amen. So let's not miss these. Let's connect these dots here, family, and put this. That's why Paul was saying, man, I was an assassin, and now I have been forgiven. Regardless of what I have done, this is amazing. What is first importance that Christ died for my sin? But not just that. Notice in Mark chapter 5, verse 9. This is the context of the man who was the demoniac, who was living in the tombs, who had so many demons in him that when Jesus said, what is your name, what did he say? I'm legion. It's not just one. There's a whole party in here. And Jesus heals him and delivers him. And then notice what he says. But he said to him, words of affirmation, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has what? Done for you. Circle that, underline that, highlight that as you study this later. And how he had mercy on you. See, the act of service is not only has God saved us, but God has healed us. Amen? Amen. He is healing us from stinking thinking. He's healing us from bitter and wounded hearts. He's healing us from being drama queens and drama kings. He's healing us from making all of everything everybody says about us. No, no, no. If we will continue to listen to his words of affirmation, receive his gifts, Walk in every single one of his precious love languages and know that we are loved by God. Then we will hear him. We will feel him. We will sense him. We will respond to the love of God. And then it goes on to say this. The last one is the physical touch. 
And this is what's so amazing. If you are not looking to pay attention to this, you will read right over this in the scriptures all the time. But in Matthew chapter 8, verse 3, every single one of the synoptic writers, every single one of them, all three of them, put this detail in here. When the man who had leprosy comes before him and he says, if you are willing, you can cleanse me. Now again, crowd, look at me for a second. Leprosy. Not just a brutal and painful disease, but I don't know what was hurting more painful. The pain of your skin literally drying up and rotting to the point that things would just literally fall off. But the agony of being separated from all family, being isolated and set apart, and not only that, we know that leprosy biblically represents sin. If you had leprosy in that day, you had to be confined into a particular area, and if for some reason you had to come out, you better have a very good reason, and you had to ring a bell as you walked, screaming, leper. Leper, leprosy. Can you imagine having to shout out your condition, the isolation, no one could come in, with, was literally kind of the rabbi said about a 12 foot distance. If you came in within that, then you were considered unclean as well. And talk about us walking in here tonight, ringing a bell. Luster, lusting, I lusted today. Prideful, prideful, I judge people on the way in here tonight. You know, how, how would you like to have to come in here ringing a bell and what's your sin? And that's the kind of isolation this person is feeling. No one can come near them. Nobody, they can only be amongst themselves, these lepers. And he says, Jesus, if you're willing, you can touch me. I mean, excuse me, you can heal me. And Jesus heals him in more ways than one, amen? amen. Look what it says he did. And he stretched out his hand and what? Now notice, church, please notice this. Write this down in your notes. He touched him before he healed him. Because he knew what needed to be healed was the guy's heart long before his skin. Can I just say, in the love of God, that you matter to God? Whatever condition you are in, you matter to God. So whatever bell you have to ring tonight, you matter to God. And he wants to touch you. So often we just... I don't know, hyper-spiritualize it. He touched me, oh, he touched me. And oh, a joy so flood my soul. Something happened, and now. Okay, a great and beautiful hymn, but do you know what you're saying when it says he touched me? It means you were not beyond the barrier of God's love. He wasn't saying get healed first and then I'll come close to you. He was saying, come, stinky pie, right now. <laughs> Just as you stay, bust up and all, come. come on. That's what he's saying. And he touched him saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy was cleansed. Matthew 8, 15. Jesus reaches out to heal another person. And this is, believe it or not, Peter's mother-in-law. Okay, Peter's mother-in-law. And he reaches out and he touches her hand and the fever left her. Now, we see Jesus all the time going, hey, boom. In fact, he wasn't even in the room one time. Remember the, the, the centurion said, ah, just say it and it'll happen. He's like, wow, such faith. So Jesus didn't need to touch. But she's sitting there dying of this fever. And what does Jesus do? He reaches out first and just person-to-person -person contact. You're a person, you're not a disease. Isn't that awesome? Did I not teach you last week that God loves us as individuals? As individuals. You don't touch masses. You touch individuals. And so he shows once again. And he says, and he touched her. And the fever left her and she arose. And what does a mother-in-law do? She goes into her love language and starts serving. <laughs> she gets up and starts waiting on him. I just love that. That's why it's so great and beautiful to know that's his mother-in-law. He comes in and that's what she does. Her love language is acts of service like so many of you. And she's so excited. She gets healed. And what does she do? She knows nothing except to start cooking. And just start making um, care for the family. Matthew chapter 9 verse 29. And he touched their eyes saying, be it done to you according to your faith. And as I said before, there's other times he didn't even touch at all. But here he knew the real need. 
Now, I've expressed this love of God. And you've heard me must many times here emphasizing the masculine in our language. Now, I need you to listen to this quote. When it comes to language about God, it should help us to understand and encounter God. Meaning, when we have things written in the Bible, the language about God, it should help us understand and encounter God. But we should not confuse the reality of God with the limits of our language. Amen. Are you hearing me there? Meaning that we use languages, but we really only have a way of going male or female. So then why did the Jewish language predominantly choose the masculine? Jot this down. Number one, because the most predominant cults were actually maternal cults at the time. There was all these mothers, God, queen of heaven, all these kind of mother cults that were going around. So one of the reasons why they chose to stay within the masculine was to remove this. But secondly, they were a patristic society. The society itself was predominantly that the man being the head of the household and so on and so forth and leadership roles and so not to confuse when it came time to put a personal pronoun they would choose the masculine so they would say he him and so you find us in the church predominantly talking about the father and the father's love but that is not the only description of God in the Bible there is neither, neither male nor female, but the divine God. It is our language that causes us to be predominant on one side. But there is imagery of God throughout the Bible that even references a mother's heart, a mother's love. Let me show you a few. Psalm 131, 2 says this. Surely I have composed and quieted my soul like a weaned child rest against his what? His mother, my soul is like a weaned child within me. The psalmist is saying, when I come before you, God, and as you've been breaking away all my dependencies on the wrong things, I'm like a child weaned by his mom. Not referencing the strength of a father, no. The nurture of a mother, the psalmist writes. In Isaiah chapter 66, the prophet says, as a what? Comforts her child, so I will comfort you, and you will be comforted over Jerusalem. This is the heart of God saying, hey, listen, as you guys understand your vernacular, your language, your limitations of being finite two-dimensional beings, I'm not, I'm infinite, but let me express my heart to you. And so as a mother comforts, now think about that. How important that imagery was to a nation who continually continued to do the baboos. And yet God was saying, like some of us who have an image in our own lives, of mom saying, Come here. Come here. Giving him a hug, giving him a noogie at the same time. God is saying, as a mom, I will comfort you. Matthew 23, 37. Oh, Jerusalem of Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to what? Her. How often I have wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were unwilling. God is saying, listen to you. You guys, as you see a mother hen bringing in her chicks, that is how I want to love you. And so, so often when he's referencing the strength side of God, he's using a masculine. But when he's referencing the father's heart, excuse me, the, 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 the loving heart of a God, he will reference mother language, and yet this just completely gets blown right over in our society, or we just read it so quickly. Hosea 13. Remember, Hosea is all about the heart of tree of the nation and God's steadfast love. And then he says this in verse 8. I will encounter them, and I love this, like a bear robbed of her cubs, and I will tear open their chest. There I will also devour them like a lioness. And a wild beast would, as a wild beast would tear them. I love this. God is saying, I'm going to watch over my nation like a mama bear. And some of you, you know that's a scary thing. The only thing to me that I've ever been frightened of in youth ministry was mama bear. You know? <laughs> this is a joke that I constantly, I mean, a true story that I always tell uh, Myola. But, you know, I had one night when I did a game with 75 junior hires. And all of a sudden, one kid's shirt gets all tear, torn up, goes home, oh, mom, he was the game. So mama bear, rawr, she goes to pick up her kid and her hair's all shirt. So she's just like, 
well, you need, you need to come see for games. What are you doing? You know, and I had the privilege and opportunity and the soundness of mind to say, well, ma'am, I had 75 kids and one kid's shirt got torn. You think maybe one kid was going a little wild? It wasn't the game. It was your Kolohe kid. <laughs> but she was all, ah, and they gave her the details. Hey, I said this, he was doing that. And she goes, oh, well, he didn't mention that. Well, of course not. <laughs> Duh. But you know, mamas, and you know school teachers, huh? So terrible, you start telling the game, you know, your son is this, what's because you're a bad teacher. <laughs> if you just controlled the classroom better, you know, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Mama bear. This is a perfect and pure and unselfish mama bear. He's saying like a bear robbed of her cubs. God says, that's what I want to do. Isaiah 49, 15, can a woman forget her nursing child? You think everyone has forgotten about you? As I said last week in the message that we feel that at the end of the day, the greatest fear is do we really matter to somebody? Do I really, really matter to somebody? God says to the prophet, can a woman forget a nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Well, even if that was possible, he's saying these may, but I will never. Like a mom who can never forget her child. See, as I mentioned in the beginning of this message that there are moms of all sorts in this room today, listening today. As I mentioned that there's every single flavor, I want to show you one right here in Romans 16 verse 13. This is the apostle Paul. And as he's writing his letter here, he's saying, hey, greet Rufus, a choice man in the Lord, and also his mother. And what does it say? Hawaiians. She hanaid me. My own family walked away from me because I was no longer a rabbi. My wife left me. Remember, to be a rabbi, you had to be married. He says in 1 Corinthians, I'm single. His family disowned them, tore the robes, said, I'll away. Don't want anything to do with you. His wife leaves him. But he found a whole new family in the family of God. And some of you, perhaps the enemy has tried to rob, kill, steal, and destroy you from a family, a, family, a physical family. But like Paul here, you can find the family, you can find the mother heart of God, the father heart of God, and the community of God's kids as we learn to respond to these five love languages he's speaking constantly over us. Amen? Amen. Is this making sense? You see, we see it here in the Bible. This is important to know. Why is this so important to know, family? Because we need to see it, know it, absorb it, and repeat it because the Bible also talks, mom about our need to influence and to influence correctly. Because as moms, we have that power. Ezekiel 16, says, Behold, everyone who quotes Proverbs will quote this proverb concerning you, saying, like mother, like daughter. Is that what you want to hear? Some of you are looking back at the generations and going, maybe that's not what I want. But the Bible says, hey, whether we like it or not, there's an influence. There's not a single adult here who hasn't done something and goes, oh my gosh, I'm just like my mother. <laughs> Things that we absorbed that we didn't know we were absorbing. Amen? Uh-huh. Now, 1 Kings twenty two fifty two, And he did evil. He's speaking about this evil king. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in the way of his mother and in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. Those of you that are reading through the Bible with us right now, you're seeing that, bam, 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 and these influences. But here he says it's the mom, and he goes even further in the Chronicles. It says, he also walked in the way of the house of Ahab, for his mother was a counselor to do wickedly. You know, that kind that says, oh, tell him that you're under 12 so we can get a cheaper ticket. <laughs> what are you teaching your kid to do? So what makes you think it's going to mean a different when it comes time to talk to you? Situational ethics is situational ethics, and you've just given them their ability to use whatever situation they like. Oh, just tell them this. Or, hey, tell your father we're doing this instead of doing this. He did it. The Bible says, Mom, you're teaching your kids to do wickedly. And of course, there's a plethora of verses in the Bible that talk about the positive influence of moms. Acts 12, 12, look at this insight. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. Take your Bible. You have G Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark is this Mark. 
How did this Mark become the writer of that New Testament, the disciple of Peter? Because the Bible study that Jesus ministered to was at his mom's house. Do not underestimate the power of having the home group minister into your house. As a 53-year-old man, I can close my eyes and remember three years old, four years old. We called them, ready for this? This is so classic, so 60s and 70s. Sip and sings. (laughs) Sip and sing. Come and have coffee and we're going to sing worship songs. But we had the sip and sings in our house and I'm a little kid sitting there watching adults that are supposed to be my idols at this point, looking at college kids as a young kid and watching them worship God. So worship was in my DNA. That's what happened to Mark. 2 Timothy 1.5, we talks about Timothy, the man who pastored the New Testament church of Ephesus. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you. Timothy, you're a man of God. And you know how I know that? Which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and where? Your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. Meaning you have been influenced. And not only that, moms, we have a responsibility given by God that you are given to train your children in the way that they should go. Can I please remind all of you that we raise chickens, we train children. (laughs) Oh, I'm raising five kids. Well, then... But you're training children today. Amen? Proverbs 6.20. My son, observe the commandment of your father and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. The words of King Lamel, it says in Proverbs 31, the oracle which his mother taught him. Hmm. Proverbs 29.15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child who gets his own way brings what? Shame. Can I just have your eyes this way? All of you as parents, all of you who may be parents, what your children will need from you today, tomorrow, or someday, if not yet, they will need a parent, not another friend. Stop letting your insecurity ruin your children because you're looking for their acceptance. God already put it there. It's biological. It's there. You love those children. You train up those children. And you know what? Spare the rod, spoil the child, and it brings a shame and a heartache to you. I particularly am one who am grateful that I was disciplined. Now, did I love it at 12? No. Thank you for the whipping on my behind because you're making me a man of character. I was just talking to somebody today or yesterday that the worst cruelty was when they told us to go get the paddle. (laughs) Ah, I'm not alone. (laughs) Go get the paddle. (laughs) Can't find it, Mom. (laughs) You want me to come in there and get it? No, I found it right here. Looky there. Looky there. Wow. And why do I say all of this, Moms? Because look at what it says here in Proverbs 15. It says, a wise son makes his father glad. But it's interesting how the proverb says, but a foolish man does what? Despises his mother. See, why should you and I honor our mom? Because it wounds their heart when we do stupid. Stupid is as stupid does, but you see a father, oh yeah, look at the accomplishments of my son. But a mom, a mom wants the child to know that they are loved, to know that they are valued, to know that they are of worth and they are living out their calling. And it says, when we're not, it wounds the heart. Some of us maybe today might need to realize, need to maybe give my mom a call today or tomorrow and say thank you for that steadfast love that never ceases. Like I learned in my Bible study that it's just like the love language of God. And when I brought heartache to you by my choices, I asked for your forgiveness. Amen? Amen. Remember, Mother's Day is not just about the mom part, but the kid part in all of us to honor the mom part in all of us regardless of how they behaved. Let me explain. Mother's Day is, in fact, a very special day for very special people. So much so that there's even a Jewish proverb that says, God cannot be everywhere, therefore he created moms. Sometimes God just needs arms, they have said, and that's what moms are about. I just showed you the scriptures that 
mother heart of God, that maternal, that comforting side of God, that we more in our minds to speak our language, the limit isn't God, it's in our language, we associate that with the mom side. And so God has given us those arms because the God-ordained antidote to pain and loss is in fact love. And we see that unconditional love so often reflected in the heart of a mom, a mother's love. But listen, fear is a liar. And to mom well, we only need to see how we've been mommed by God. Amen? We have all been mommed by God. And God has spoken love through these five love languages throughout words of affirmation, spending quality time when we didn't even know that God was there, receiving gifts that God has poured out into us constantly, including the awareness to know love, acts of service and physical touch, where if you have encountered it, you know what I'm talking about, and if you have not yet, then perhaps it's because it's the absence of quality time to feel the touch. Because there's nothing like being touched by God. Nothing. Again, I know that not everyone here today had a great relationship with their mom. But may I go and say this, please? Perhaps we did not understand their love language. You're a person sitting here today and saying, my, my mom never said I love you. My mom never said I'm proud of you. My mom never said, but gosh, did you have clean underwear? Did you have food in the refrigerator? Perhaps your mom did not really have the words of affirmation, love, gift, but she expressed it in acts of service. And all these years we've judged her because she didn't love our love language. And so as I said, we reach out in the way that we, are, the way that we love is the way in which we want to be loved. And so often we have judged boyfriends, girlfriends, parents, as not being loving, when perhaps according to the lesson we've seen today in the heart of God, he speaks all five. But though we are bilingual, we're not all, whatever the word is, pen, tuk of lo. <laughs> five of lo. Someone will correct me at the end of the service, I know it. Some Google nerd's gonna come tell me, go for it. <laughs> but is that fair to say maybe we just missed their love, amen? I end with this, all of us have the privilege as God's kids and the lineage as God's kids to not only know his love, but to live his love. The her love, the mother heart of God, the father heart of God, because love languages flow from God and he speaks them all fluently. And if that is the case, then so can God's kids. Amen? Amen. So can we, so can we. And isn't that what John 3, 16 is all about? When it says, God so loved the world. Again, it says that he gave, but I could literally write it and just say that God gave the one and only son. You see, love wins. If you and I will respond to the heart of love of God today, this weekend can be turned completely upside right in any way that the thief would want to come and kill, steal, and destroy. Your relationship can be transformed and healed because we all recognize that each of us with our own woundedness is trying to minister in whatever way through our own woundedness. Let's not make people love other than they know how to love. Let's love as God is loving us. Amen? If you would like to... Hey, thank you for spending your time with us today at One Love Ministries and being a part of our program. But this invitation that you heard today through the Word of God is directly to you. I want you to know if you have not yet made a profession of faith, meaning ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, that invitation is available to you right now. Change, transformation, all the glorious things that God wants to do are available to you, but you gotta ask. You must personally invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. So if God has been speaking to you during this message, your heart's been beating, your hands been getting kind of sweaty, you've been wrestling with things, guess what? That's the Lord knocking on your heart. And I wanna lead you right now in a prayer that can allow you to invite Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior and open the door for eternity for you and Him to be together. I want you to pray with me right now. It's not a magic prayer, but an honest heart. 
that will invite the Lord into your life. Join me right now. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I ask you to forgive me and to become my Lord and Savior. Today, Jesus, I believe that you are God and that you saved me and my faith will be put in you. Please give me your Holy Spirit to come in and upon me that I might learn how to live as a child of God. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. And today, I come home. In your name I pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer with us, we are excited. The Bible says the angels in heaven are rejoicing and we want to join them too. So would you call this number right here on the bottom of the screen and let us know. We want to help you find a church that's in your area. Get plugged in, get fellowship, get disciple, as the Bible says, because we want to grow in God's grace together. God bless you. He loves you. We're excited. To receive a copy of today's message, please write down the sermon number on your screen and give us a call at 955-9335. For service times and locations, check us out on the web at onelove.org. Mahalo for watching.